Tank monkey. Get it? Because he's wearing a tank top. I looked up the origin of the word tank. It was actually a secret code word that was used during development in 1915. The Mark I was the world's first tank. It was developed by the British. <laughs> nice wagon wheel. So they called it the tank. I wonder what they would have called it otherwise. I like Brian Regan's joke about how the walkie-talkie was a military invention. What's it called? Walkie-talkie! Look, I'm walkie and I'm talking! I wonder what the inventor of the walkie-talkie would have called a tank. The shooty-scooty? Anyway, I got into a bit of a monkey phase, I guess. Here's a cluster of monkey pencil sketches I did. Here's a monkey in a mech suit. Here's a sea monkey, a boxer monkey, a fighter monkey paired up with a turd Ferguson monkey. You know that SNL sketch. Turd Ferguson. Here's a monkey guard, some monkey heads and bodies, monkey with a robot, and of course, because I'm a child, a monkey butt. <laughs> so as I already said, the tank monkey came from a pencil sketch. Did I already say that? I drew it really tiny, took a photo of it and put it, in, and put it into Photoshop. I like to use the liquify tool and squash the sketch around until I'm happy with the shapes. Liquify is a time saver. I think all the programs out there have liquify. Corel has an equivalent tool, the distorto brush, which I actually prefer. It's nice being able to move stuff around without having to go into a separate window, but we're in Photoshop. So we don't have that option. I like, I like Photoshop, but you know. Cut them out using the lasso tool. No, wait, stop. Refine that sketch first, you big dummy. Now you can cut it out with confidence. Confidence. Cut out all piece, fuck, so fucking loud outside. We're in like fucking white trash Meth County. Shut up! Shut the fuck up! Cutting out all pieces onto their own layers is a bit of a pain in the ass, but it's easier to work on things that have been separated. The parts I've separated are the monkey, his hands, or mud hooks, as my grandpa would say, the turret, the gun barrel, the tank body, and the two sets of tracks. The two sets of tracks are also separate from one another. Figure out the values. I don't start coloring until I'm at least sort of happy with where the values are at. Sometimes you need to separate another piece to make things easier on yourself. I need to separate the gun mantlet. Mant, mantlet. The part at the base of the gun barrel. Having things separated makes it easy to get consistent shapes and sharp edges where you need them. Using clipping masks, it's so much easier to work on stuff. That gun barrel looks alright, I guess. The straight lines on the barrel are perfectly straight because of the way I use the selection tool. Because the rest of the tank was selected by hand, I need to wiggle tries, de-perfectifies, those perfectly straight lines on the gun barrel. Or I need to perfectify the rest of the shapes. But no, not gonna do that. Not only do I not like the style of perfect shapes all over, all around, but I don't like the precedent it sets. Once you have all perfect shapes, the imperfections of the perspective and forms and lighting, and everything else is gonna stick out. Uh, so the more you refine something, the more inaccuracies will start to show their ugly, stupid little heads. In attempt to illustrate this further, I drew a completely new original character uh, it's not derivative in any way. Notice how his eyes are drawn using perfect circles and the rest of him is messy and hand-drawn. Maybe this isn't a good example because the eyes and the face are usually a focal point. So it's not, you know, but anyway. Typically, the contrast of perfect shapes with imperfect shapes isn't good for an image. It's, it's distracting. Consistency is important. It's important in general. Form, style, lighting, etc. It's important. Don't you dare question the importance.
notes of consistency. Of course, as a style choice, deliberate inconsistency is okay, like making parts graphical and parts painterly on purpose. But it can look bad if it's not done deliberately. Don't just be lazy and say it's a style choice. Laziness is not a style choice. Li liquify each individual part until you like the shapes. Try to get the perspective and forms right on your shapes. No offense to the man, and I really mean that, but I don't want a Pablo Picasso tank with majorly whack-ass proportions and perspective. Even if Picasso is your favorite artist of all time, you have to agree that he was like the Benjamin Button of art fundamentals. I mean, look at this. This is his early work, and this is his late work. What the heck happened? He really couldn't apply some of the fundamentals to his late work? N no offense to him. Anyway, I used multiply layers to color. Be aware that multiply wi layers... Oh my gosh. Be aware that multiply layers will F with your values by darkening them. When you notice stuff looks wrong, work to fix it. Always. Think about all the things that are wrong in a painting that you notice later. This, this calls back to the don't be lazy rule. Doing the most fixes possible today will help you to have less regret and be more proud of your work for a longer period of time. I used to be very lazy and ignore mistakes even though I saw them. So, as a result, I would hate my art almost immediately after finishing it. And now, I only hate my artwork about a few months after. That's improvement. I know it's very tempting, but don't be lazy. Don't, just don't do it. Paint chips, chipping paint. I love this look. It reminds me of Warhammer or tabletop gaming figurines. Oh, you're the nerd. Add a rim light that follows the forms to make the shapes even more convincing. When I first started painting rim light, I would just do a line around the edge. Don't, don't do that. Rim lighting needs to follow the forms because it's, it's light. It's not, it's not a line that just goes around the edge. Adding a value gradient across the image also helps it to look more like it's in a scene and less graphical. Things further from light source, of course, will be less lit. Painting some banana designs on the tank. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do for the banana designs. So I spent like a hundred years trying different things. I'm glad I did in the end. I just wish it didn't take so long for me to get to that final result. Bullet holes. Clearly this tank has been used a lot judging by all the chipping paint. So I would find it hard to believe that it has completely avoided any kind of attack or retaliation. Retaliation. I haven't done it for this guy, but try to get into the story of your painting. Why are things the way they are? Ask yourself questions about the story of your image. This can help you push the design of your concept. I don't know much about military stuff, but you could look into rankings, military rituals, and stuff from different cultures. I would bet that tank operators and gunners have their own kind of culture that you could look into for ideas. Even though the above light source isn't very strong, I put some reflected light onto the underside of the tank barrel, tracks, and underside of the body. It's brown, so you're assuming that the ground is dirt. Reflected light, even when the scene is maybe not super fit for it, it can really make an illustration look nice. Keep it subtle, of course. Uh, there are tons of tutorials on, out there on lighting. I'm sure Stan Prokopenko has a really good one. Clint Searley has a really good one on shading that covers lighting and shading. Uh, Lighting and shading is a pretty big thing to conquer. Like many things, it's not as simple as one might think. There, you know, you have reflected light, pinched light, core shadows, you know, just tons, tons of junk you gotta remember. Cast shadows, ambient light, uh, or occlusion, whatever. So, so many things. This is not a Sherman tank, however, I think I heard somewhere that the American Sherman tank that was used in World War II had an extension on the barrel to make it look more threatening. That's kind of hilarious if it's true. 
Sherman tanks were weak compared to other tanks on the battlefield, but they cheap and quick to make. That's how I wrote my notes. But they were cheap and quick to make. There were so many of them that they would overwhelm the enemy, like being eaten by a bunch of ants. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not just perpetuating bogus information. If I am, you know, do the research yourself or tell me how much of an idiot I am in the comments. Now I'm just faffing about pretty much till the end. Rendering is important in its own way, but it's best to keep it for late in the process. Pretty much till the end, unless you're gonna, you know, no, yeah, till the end. Otherwise, if you end up needing to do substantial changes to the base design, you might lose a lot of your premature rendering work. Don't skip ahead. I find that I skip ahead when I'm excited about a painting. Because I want to get into it. I want to get in there. Take your time. Take your damn time. Also, you might shy away from fixing base design flaws if you've spent a lot of time prematurely rendering it. It really sucks having to backtrack, so it's a good idea to tr try to plan things out and be a little more careful as you go. Depending on the seriousness of the base design flaw that needs fixing, you might just be able to use a liquify tool to squash that shit into place. Before starting to render, look at your image from afar, flip it, spin it around, take a short break, have a cheeseburger, briefly put it in a grayscale, then if you're totally happy with it, start rendering. Skipping ahead in the process almost always bites you in the ass at the end. So that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Uh bye-bye. <laughs>